Now, their idea here is what they call real-time inventory. So as it gets down to the last, say, two bottles, it would send out a little alert to the back room, which would tell the stock boy to come out and put some more Pantene shampoo on the shelf. That's the main reason why they want what's called item level tagging. That means putting it on the individual item. Uh, we have many reasons not to want that as consumers, um, probably the, the most important of which is that if we leave the store with those tags on there, then we can be item level tagged and the doorway can read us and know what's in our pocket. Shampoo, you know, I don't usually carry around a bottle of shampoo with me, um, but I do carry around lots of other things with me that could be item level tagged. Uh, one of the first things that I saw when I went into the store is uh, the, the RFID, um, excuse me, not RFID, but the, the tracking grocery cart. And this is sort of one of my pet peeves is retail environments are now tracking people as they walk around. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. And um, when I got to the back of the room, there, or excuse me, the back of the, um, the, the store, they had uh, this RFID reader kiosk. And what this does is the little X is the reader device. You can hold the product up to the reader device. And on the screen behind, you'll get information about the product. It might say, oh, this is Pantene, and here's a picture of a model who's washed her hair with it. I don't know. You know information about the Pantene shampoo or whatever else it is that you're holding up there. Um, it's interesting because I asked, what is the read range on these tags? In other words, how far away can a reader, does a reader, how close does a reader have to be before it can pick up the information? And rather than telling me the answer, which later turned out to be about four and a half feet, instead um, the gentleman said, well, test it and see. So I held it up to the reader device and it blinked out at about six inches. And I said, so you're telling me the read range is about six inches? He said, that looks like six inches. So it's very interesting how um, the answer was not, well, no, the read range is four and a half feet. The answer was, it looks like about six inches. Now, that's significant because you can tune a reader device down. You can reduce the amount of power coming out of it to give someone the impression that it has a short read range, when in reality, if you cranked it up to its highest legal limit, you could get a much longer read range out of it. So as you move forward with, with this technology and as it begins surrounding us in things like, um, gee, in England, they have it as the, uh, the transit pass. It actually opens up your way into the subway. And you have to hold it right up against the reader to open it. So when I ask people, aren't, don't you have privacy concerns? Oh, well, the read range is only an inch. Now, well, you don't know that. They could crank that thing down and make it a quarter of an inch. They could crank it back up and read it from across a room, potentially. So you, you don't really know that. And that's one of the reasons why we need labeling on the tags stating what their maximum read range is as well. So not just labeling telling you it's there, which is one of my pet peeves that we don't know where it is, but also labeling telling you more information about how far away it can be read and information about where the reader devices are so you're not inadvertently walking past them all the time being scanned. All right, um, here's another thing that I found at this Metro store. Uh, there's a lot of talk about killing the tags at the point of sale. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be surveilled in the, in the store. It's another thing to be surveilled when you leave the store. And the, what they had set up was something they called the killer kiosk. I actually called it the undead machine. And what, what this killer kiosk did was you were supposed to pay for your groceries at this future store and then take your items over to this other kiosk, which, by the way, was sort of inconveniently located sort of back around behind where you just came out. You're supposed to take them over there and one by one put them on this machine and push a button to deactivate the tags on them. And as you can imagine, not a lot of consumers were actually doing this. Um, when I went over to check it out, they had been boasting that, you know, we have the first deactivation kiosk anywhere on the planet and it's really great. So I went over there and I held up the Pantene shampoo and this screen showed up. And I don't know how well you can see it, but up across the top it says barcode number and it's got a series of zeros. And then down below, there's like an E0401, blah, blah, blah. There's a, there's a serial number down at the bottom. And when I originally held it up, they were all numbers. And when I pushed the button, bzz, the numbers along the top were replaced with zeros. But the number in the bottom stayed constant. Now, there's, there's a reason why this is significant. What Metro had done, what the Future Store had done, was program a programmable part of the chip. Right? Now, there's two different kinds of chips. There's chips that are written at the factory once and you never can write them again. And then there's chips with a little programmable area where they can overwrite other information on them. And what they had done here was actually write, overwrite the barcode information into them. So you could take a whole box of products, you could put it on a, on a read writer, you could write that barcode number onto all of them, and then voila, now when you scan it, you know what, what that item is because of its barcode number. When they erased it, they simply erased the barcode number, but they didn't erase the unique ID number 
And only that item on the whole planet has that unique ID number. Nothing else is numbers E0401, et cetera, et cetera. That's its unique ID number. So um, you'll see in the next picture, there's me like waiting <laughs> for this to be erased. <laughs> they said, wait, it's going to deactivate. And I'm standing there, and as you can see, sort of puzzled, like, OK, well, so like, yeah. And the, the look on their faces, I, I put this slide in here because I, I love the classic look on their faces, which is we don't get what the problem is. And we had this total miscommunication. It wasn't a language barrier. They spoke great English. But we had this total moment where you could tell the difference between supply-side guys and privacy people. And it was a complete disconnect. They were like, well, we've deleted the barcode number. And I said, well, I don't care about the barcode number. I care about that unique ID number because that's, what's, that's the, the social security number. That's the serial number. That's the thing you're going to use to identify this back with me. And they just didn't get it. So uh, it was an interesting moment. Now, this picture. Remember I told you if you put them in the microwave, they burn? They really do burn. <laughs> this is an RFID tag. This is a fairly, fairly good size. It's about this big. And uh, this is after like three seconds in the microwave. This is not 20 minutes. This is literally three seconds. I put it in and I hit five seconds. And long before I got there, it was like in flames. So um, it, your, your choices if you want to deactivate an RFID tag is you can kind of stand there puzzled waiting for it to do whatever it does, which, you know, this is the only one in the, on the planet, by the way. So you can stand there doing that or you can do this. Um, but there's really not a lot of options for consumers to deactivate RFID tags. So really your only choices are remove it. You could cut the antenna off the chip. You can't really crush it. Water doesn't, um, doesn't affect some of these. Some of these can go through industrial uh, laundering processes and not be destroyed. So there's really, we don't have a lot of options for killing chips. They're working on um, a new standard for RFID tags that would be killable, but uh, as of yet, they're still hashing out the standard, much less have, uh, have they actually produced those chips. OK. Now, here, to, just to get to the end of my Metro Future Store story. So at, afterwards, we're all eating donuts, and we're having a little chat after our three-hour tour around the store. And they assured me that they'd showed me every application of RFID in the store. And just so you know, they had only tagged Pantene Shampoo, Kraft Philadelphia Cream Cheese, Gillette Razor Blades, and DVDs. Those are the only items in the entire store that had been tagged, because it's a trial. So they're not going to spend the money. Th these tags are actually quite expensive. Um, some estimates say between 20 and 50, 60 cents a piece. So they're not going to put those on every item in the store yet. They're just testing it out, seeing what, they're, what that's going to entail. So you know, I was told, OK, you've seen everything. We've shown you all the, 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 whole, the whole shebang. And I asked like three times, I just want to make sure I've really seen it all, right? That you're not hiding anything. Oh, no, we have an openness policy. They hand me this pamphlet. And so we were, we're showing you, we're showing the public everything. Well, so the next day, I'm giving a talk in Germany. And just to give you a sense of how, how just bizarre my life is, um, the talk is in, a, is in a cafe, which is underground. And it turns out it's a converted underground Nazi bunker <laughs> that they've turned into this, this coffee shop. So anyway, just, uh, just a bizarre place to have this experience happen to me. So I'm down in this, in this coffee shop and just giving a talk to a crowd about this size. And I'm showing these tagged Pantene shampoo and the tagged Gillette products. And everybody's, you know, aghast. We have a little reader device kind of like this, you know, hooked up to the computer. We've got a PowerPoint. And I'm holding them. And as I hold them one by one, you know, the numbers appear up on the screen. So people are going, yeah, well, there really is a number in there. Well, on a whim, one of the people uh, up there on the stage with me, part of this privacy group I was working with, said, well, you know, next they're going to be putting these in our loyalty cards, you know, our little frequent shopper cards. And he pulls out the payback card. I love this name. It's the German Metro uh, reward card. It's called the payback card. And he says, yeah, right, next they're going to put it in there. And he holds it up to the reader device, and I will be dipped if a number did not appear on the screen. And what we found out was they had actually <laughs> hidden an RFID tag and an antenna in people's shopper carts. And they were tracking, tracking people, not just products. And in fact, not only were they tracking people, but they were tracking people from what we could tell as they entered and left the store through those portal devices that they had in the doorway to make sure you weren't stealing the products. They were tagging people right through their wallets, right through their purses, and identifying people. Now, we were scandalized. In fact, what you see at the right here is an x-ray. So you can actually see the antenna going around and around on there. And in fact, people were so upset about this that uh, they forced a recall. Turned out 10,000 people had been given this. And when I heard that, I went, OK, well, now I know why, why 